Hey, hey, everybody. We are back with a little bit of a, a different video, an interview video, where we get to talk to someone who is in the audiobook industry doing recordings, Dan Bittner. And we got a couple of questions for him. He might have some questions for us. Who knows? But uh, we want to talk with him about, you know, state of the industry, just getting started with it. In fact, let's let's start there. How did you get started with doing audiobooks, Dan? Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Um, yeah. I definitely was not a voracious reader growing up, so the idea of me doing audio books was pretty daunting in the beginning, but I went to school for acting and agents sending you on everything from commercials to theater to, to uh, TV and film, and uh, one of the voiceover jobs that came up was an audio book, and I remember thinking like, well, this is something that I can't do because I don't really read, and there must be people that do this professionally and have studied it and everything like that, and so... Uh, I'd auditioned for a few before I got one that I actually booked and it was terrifying because I didn't know what to do. And I, I'd done voiceover work, but nothing so grand, like, you know, four or five days in a studio recording a single book. And so I did the first book I did was actually, uh, to make matters worse was four books. It was a fantasy series. So it was a bunch of voices and things like that. And I said, you know, do you want me to do voices for the other characters? And they're like, yeah, that's that's what you do, Dan. I was like, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. And so I'm just trying to think like, oh, how big do you go on these? And I listened to a bunch of audiobooks. So I thought, OK, all right, I think I can handle this. And so I did this four series with a very, very nice director who'd worked in the business for years and a great team of engineers. And the uh, uh, whole series was a ton of fun. And so I kind of cut my teeth doing that uh, series of books. And that like really just threw me into the deep end of the pool. And from there, it was slow auditions and getting to know publishers, getting to know different authors and build, uh, building those relationships so that eventually you're starting to be offered books. You're starting to audition for books and they already know you. So they're like, we're looking for this kind of tone from you, Dan, and stuff. So it makes it a lot easier. Now that I have like over 100 books under my belt, now it's like I know the industry a lot more. I know like kind of the tone of a book that's going on. Um, but it really was not something I was looking to do. It just fell into my lap and I uh, really, really enjoyed doing it. And so I just kind of kept at it. I just, you've already made me think of a million questions I would ask you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go for the million. I'm just going to go for the, uh, the director you brought up. I found really interesting. Is that normally the case that you've, you know, got someone that's, I mean, I come from a theater background as well. So I know a bit about, you know, what a director would normally do. Is, is it like that? Is there someone who's there checking in or are they just at the beginning end? just what's that process like? Yeah. And it's something that every narrator really wants is usually a director but the budget usually doesn't allow it you know it's like sometimes it's just me sometimes it's just me and an engineer and if things are great and the budget's good and maybe it's a big house maybe it's a big book whatever it is you'll have a director involved too and the director is great because the director has prepped the book i've prepped the book we both know what we're reading they're taught we can kind of talk about characters we can talk about tone uh, a shift in pace whatever it is and any narrator is going to go back into their bag of tricks they're gonna fall into a rhythm where it's just kind of like this throughout the whole book and so what's great about having a director there is they're listening the entire time they're like let's paint the picture a little bit more you know let's like really find how angry this character is here and try to explore that and so it's great it's somebody checking in if you're doing your job they're not on you every other line because that would be maddening it's five days it's you know thousands and thousands of words you don't want somebody every sentence kind of coming in and telling you what's uh, uh this you know inflection or this you know uh syllable should be hit or whatever but they're going to guide you and it's going to be great and so it's like it feels like a collaborative effort rather than you in a studio by yourself just kind of speaking for hours on end into a microphone so i would assume that then the whether or not you end up with a director depends on the budget of the production right uh, how big of a right. book is this right 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 and it doesn't have to be huge but there's some houses like penguin random house is notorious for always having a director and it's great so if you get a job with penguin big house you know they have a lot of great books under their belt um they're usually always going to have a director assigned to each book um but that's not the case across the board it, it really is random it's like you said it's like it depends on the budget of a book and even if it's a you know, self-published author, you know, like they might have enough cloud or they might have, you know, the budget to be like, no, I want every bell and whistle you can throw at this. And they'll, they'll have that. Or they have a team that they love and they're like, great, we want to do this director with this actor. And, you know, uh, 
it, it's kind of set in stone before the project is even written. So for the smaller things, do you just have like a closet or a space in your garage that you've converted into your own little sound booth? Yeah, because of COVID-19, I've done kind of basically that. Uh, you know, before that, I never recorded from home other than auditions. And I would usually always go to a studio. And, and those are kind of the nice, fun, cushy jobs because you're around other people. You know, it's like you'll go to a studio where there's, you know, four or five, six, seven studios. And so you're talking to other narrators on lunch breaks. And it's great. It's really fun. Um, but with COVID, everything became like, okay, you know, I was in the middle of a book and it's just like, what do you do? And so I'd worked with a couple of engineers that were like, here's what you need to buy. Here's the kind of setup you need. I'd worked in the industry long enough to be like, I have an idea of what to do, but I had to learn a little bit of the editing aspect of it, what software you need to use. So for me, I have uh, a house, you know, that I moved into uh, here out in the burbs in New York City. And I was able to go into the basement and just literally like build PVC pipes and blankets and things like that. And that was my studio for six months. And then I was able to get a contractor in and build a 12 by 12 room that has like some pretty good like drywall and special you know, stuff going on, deadening all that to, to, to deaden the sound. And then I just built a room within a room. And now it's a much better studio setup. Like these are panels that, you know, uh, I can deaden all the sound in the room. So it's not echoey and things like that. It's just so cool. Like again, there's just so, so, so many elements to what you're talking about. They're just fascinating to me. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to keep with the main things uh, that, that I know we want to talk about. But I, I have to ask, um, you mentioned, you know, self-publish or not. Uh, what what are some of the differences you've seen with that? And then this is this is quasi and really, I'll, I'll wait to the end. Just self-publish or not, let's just go with that. Have you noticed much difference? And do do authors get involved in this much in either the traditional publishing or self-publishing space? Yeah, I've seen completely hands-off authors where they're like, I didn't even think about the audiobook. Best of luck to you. Here's how you pronounce that name, you know, and Bob's your uncle. But other, I've had other authors where it's too much and they're like, we want to listen in on everything and like, you know, comment on every kind of character voice that you're doing. Now, sometimes it's like, that seems a little much like you need to trust that I can, I, I'm going to, you know, bring you know my my expertise and, and let me work and i'm going to do it um but there's a happy medium where an author's like here's kind of what i thought about the character i've given you this description in the book so you know he's a gravelly voice you know he, he he's a guy who is no nonsense whatever and i might have a question about it and we'll go back and forth and that's great like that's kind of the perfect amount of like just give me enough that i have a kernel to go off of and then i can really expand um it's the most fun to see a self-published author that you know maybe doesn't have the backing of a huge publisher and they're really into it they're really excited and they're just like you know whatever you want to do and i thought about this and and it's great and i love that because it's really important to them and audiobook sales you can tell are really really important it's a huge market for them it's not just the you know print or or you know in most cases with the um, self publishing it's just you know an ebook and it's the audiobook and it it could be like equal sales or maybe even the audiobook bring in more money for them so they're really uh, it's really important to them so i want to make sure that i am doing their story justice uh, but you will also find with those self published people that have a lot of of following their following is also very specific. Like I've done one Star Wars book and like, no matter what you do in the Star Wars universe, people are like, that's not what I would do. Or that's, you know, like, and you're kind of just throw your hands up. And you're like, I know, man, that's, listen, I'm a fan too. It's a, it's as good as I can do, you know? It's like, I'm sure there's something in your head that you've always thought like that character should sound, you know, Spanish or, or German or whatever. And uh, so, it, you know, you can get caught into those um ideas of uh, what a character or a book should be but usually everybody's pretty cool and excited to like do the project all right i've got an admission to make uh in that uh the first book that i put out there uh on amazon at a certain point i was like ah uh, i i we, I really need an audio book for this and i like jeff like you have a uh, background in acting so i thought I'll just do it. Right. And so I bought the PVC pipes and I did the, you know, the blankets and whatever, and got myself a microphone. And I think I got two chapters in. And I was like, this is so hard. It's uh, so much harder than you think. It, yeah. I, I truly, it was, it was extremely intimidating, but it gave me at least 
uh, enough so that I knew how much I didn't know. And so I'm curious, having gone through that, at least for, you know, a couple of days and trying to do that, as you are coming up with voices and as you are uh, figuring out your narrator voice and all, all of the vocal choices and acting choices that you have to make, do you do it all in a go? What I mean is, do you switch in a single take from here is the 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 narrator speaking, and then go into the voice for the character, and then back to the narrator, or do you do do you do different passes where you do all the narration and then come back and do the the character in a right. separate voice? Right, right. Uh, I do it all in one go. So you know, I but I've also done the prep work beforehand. So I know the character. I have it either written down in the actual PDF. Um, there's a program that most narrators use called I Annotate, and I Annotate's great because you can highlight, you can make, you know, actual recordings within that. So it can be like, how did that guy sound, or how did I pronounce that, you know, made up planet or whatever. So I, I have it usually ready to go. So I'm not like thinking about what does this guy sound like or what does this woman sound like. Um, I have that at least that homework done, so I can go into the narrator and then right into that voice. But there are some voices that are just too tricky that you're just like, oh, this this person is the accent's weird, or or maybe it just requires a ton of vocal energy. So I will have to kind of go back a little bit and be like, all right, let me just go back again. But it's one through pass. It's not like I'm recording one set of dialogue, then going through and recording the second set of dialogue for a different character. Uh, and also just to, you know, on what you said about, you know, you recording your own book, the, the two things that uh, I thought of when you mentioned that is one, it's the whole thing of narration is a muscle. It's, it's, it's the talent, but it's also a muscle. And so the first 10 books that you do, no matter who you are, are not going to go well. It's going to make you frustrated. You're going to mess up every sentence. You're like, I'm a, you know, I majored in English. I've written a hundred books. Why can't I do this? I saw a guy who is one of the, um, his name's Mike. I forgot his last name, but he's like, you know, one of the showrunners of the Simpsons uh, recording his own autobiography. And I was a big fan. So I was always trying to chit chat with him. And I was just like, how's it going? And he's like, it's going terrible. It's going terrible. I like, he's like, I've told these stories in colleges for 20 years and he's like and I can't get it into the microphone and I was like yeah it's just because it's a muscle that you need to build and the fact that you did it is also going to help you with your writing because you're going to be like oh you know when I wrote it in my head it sounded great but actually saying it out loud maybe it's like that doesn't sound right or there's like a flow that's not there and I find that that's the most common um the most common like note I have for any author is like try to read your stuff out loud because there's some things that'll look okay on the paper, but as soon as you read it out loud, it's like, that sounds weird. Something about that doesn't work. And it's because it just doesn't like flow with the natural sense of language. Yeah, I got one chapter into the narration. And I'm like, I need to rewrite this book. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you would have thought that no matter what, because it's like, you're, you're probably a harsh critic of your own work. And so, you know, that's where you really like are just out there naked on the stage is when you're just reading your own work. I, I can't imagine I've never written anything. So, you know, tip of the hat to you to not only re, uh, write a book, but also narrate it as well. Well, I still haven't finished, so don't, don't dip the head too far. <laughs> but those, those first two chapters, though, I'm sure. Right. I was going to say, there was a little chapter two, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so it's, it's like you knew where I, where I was going to go, because I wanted to ask you, I mean, you, you pretty much already answered it, but, you know, are there any other notes for authors, anything that an author could bring to the person who's going to be recording their book uh, that would be helpful, useful, uh, maybe that they wouldn't think of on their own? Well, you know, one of the funny, like, I, I think a lot of, narrators say the same thing um so i'll repeat them one is like it sounds really cool to have like a table of 15 people playing poker and, and you know and like them all talking but when you do it in an audiobook it is confusing like you can't tell what's going on it doesn't make sense and that's why most scenes are great when it's like a small number of people it's under five people are talking to each other but if you have like a a very, unless it's like, okay, this has to be a, you know, we're in front of the Congress, we're in front of like a group of people, it's a, it's a tribal unit of like eight or nine different tribes talking to each other, you know, for the most part, you want to try to keep it simple, because then you're going to be able to tell the story, I'm going to be able as a narrator to give like full weight to what you're trying to 
uh, have the reader or listener in this case, you know, take away from your story. You know, you can have these very, very strong central characters tell the entire story of the room. Um, and then the other thing is, is like with the prep work, if you have a good idea of, you know, if, if you're doing sci-fi or fantasy, where you're making up some of the locations, the, the nouns, you know, the, the per people, places and things are just completely made up it's always helpful for a narrator where you can say, okay, tell me like, how, you, how do you hear that word pronounced? You know, is, is that a name that you're taking from the English language from a different, you know, like Russian or, or German, or is that just completely made up? And then think about like that. How does that work in a flow of a paragraph or dialogue, you know, things like that. Um, otherwise, like I just, to, to reiterate what I said, it's the dialogue. Like really, if you're only reading one thing in your book, read the dialogue out loud because you're going to, that's the easiest thing to, it'll, it'll seem to make the most sense on the page, but actually that's the hardest thing to write convincingly. And, and so I find that I have to work extra hard to try to say like, well, how do I, how do I make this clunky sentence work, you know, with this dialogue, because all the information is there and, and the intention is there, but the way it's written is almost, you know, too flowery for what this character would probably normally write, uh, speak in or, um, it's just, you know, doesn't make sense in, in the natural flow of things. It's just also fascinating. <laughs> just, 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 I feel like this is, I could just keep asking questions of the day, but I'm not going to. Um, so what, what, one other thing I've, I've recently noticed, and I'm curious if you're involved with this at all, or maybe it's, you know, it's just not been on my radar, but I started noticing that there's a studios like sound booth studio where they have a collection of, or a group of audiobook narrators who will do a book. So, you know, I, I've read books or listened to books, I should say, where, you know, we've got one person doing one person's chapter and a different person doing somebody else's chapter, which is cool. But now I'm starting to see somewhere, even a character within a chapter being a different voice talent, right? So, you know, you're reading the main chapter, but then Cameron's coming in, you know, saying this one character's dialogue. And then I'm seeing some that are even more like old radio plays where they're doing sound effects and stuff like that. So, which is is this is this new? Am I out of the loop? You know what's what's going on with this? Are you involved in it at all? Yeah. So that I mean, like they have different. You know, like you said, it's like it could be just a single narration book. It can be a dual narration or you know three person narration. And usually, how that works is each person takes a chapter, and usually each chapter is in the point of view of a certain character. I'm reading Tom. Sarah here is reading Samantha. You know, and and so we'll have those done. And those are very common, especially in young adult uh, romance, you know, things like that. Like, it's very, very common. It's very popular. But uh, what you also are seeing a lot more of, and the reason that you're starting to notice it a lot more, Jeff, is because there's more budgets. You know, audiobooks are making a lot of money. Like, the business is really good. So they're putting a lot more money into these budgets, and they're trying to up their game. And so you're seeing full cast audiobooks. And, you know, a great example of that is, you know, Audible does uh, full cast, basically radio plays. Um, and I've had the privilege to do a lot of those. And they're so much fun because they record basically live. So you're working like I did one that was, um, uh, oh, gosh, I forget the name of it now. But it, it, it was basically like an army uh, book where, uh, you know, there's eight guys on a squad going into Mexico and they're like, get down, and do, 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 you know, and so they're having sound effects. And so it was so much fun because I'm, you know, working through like basically a Zoom with all these different actors. And I was like, Charlie, go down there, you know, and he's like, I'm shot, my legs bleeding out. And, and so you have this like cool, you know, atmosphere being built with the sound design coming later. Um, you have big celebrities doing those kind of things because they're really trying to throw a lot of people and money at them and they create these great products and I love it. And like, I, I mean, I grew up listening to like the Star Wars radio drama. I listened to uh, any kind of um, full cast audio books I'd love. And like Neil Gaiman is doing a lot of those. Like if you've never listened to uh, any of his like full cast audio books, like they're incredible. Like there's such great actors and uh, dynamics. And so they'll usually have like a narrator going through but like you said, when a character comes out, it's actually a different actor playing that specific character. Um, and they'll usually have for the smaller roles, one actor playing three or four. So it's like, you know, the guy, the bartender, you know, this random patron, whatever. Um, yeah. So you are seeing a lot more of those. They've always existed. But now that audiobooks are really, you know, becoming front and center, you're starting to see a lot more of them, which is great. I love it. I don't, if I just have to work by myself the whole time, I'd go miserable, you know? So if I can work with other actors in that capacity, I love it. 
That sounds amazing. It's just so cool. Like I just I listened to one recently and it just blew me away. I was like, what is this extra voice coming in for this character? But what you're describing sounds amazing. But sorry, Cameron, it looks like you're about to say about to say I was something. just gonna say one of the things that we have been seeing uh a lot of chatter about in sort of the indie publishing world is the influx of AI art uh, and uh, artists getting really upset uh, and, and feeling like their style, their work is being unfairly uh, reproduced, reused without their consent. And there's been a real backlash against the use of AI art. Um, and I'm beginning to see some of that same conversation happening in regards to audiobooks. Is that something that uh, you have noticed that conversation at all? How do you feel about it uh, as a voice actor, an audiobook narrator? Uh, what's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's been talked about for years, you know, like that's probably be in the conversation, you know, when you, when you talk to your unions, uh, you know, I'm part of the uh, Screen Actors Guild. SAG-AFTRA. And so it will always come up, you know, within the last five years of like, what are we doing about AI? And somebody will, you know, a union rep will say, we have gone to like a CES or we've gone to some kind of conference and we've seen some technology that it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. And as that built, all of a sudden it came just full front and center with Apple Books introducing a AI narration option for, especially for, you know, self-published authors who don't have a huge budget it seems like and i don't know all the details of this but it seems like it's much cheaper or at least cheaper option than hiring somebody like me especially hiring like a director and an engineer and all that so i've you know it's something that through my text chains with my friends that are narrators and through union meetings and stuff that it's been talked about um and i'm definitely not for it it's not something that I'm thrilled about, but I also know like it's, it's, it's a mistake to completely go on the other side of that. I mean, I think we've seen every large company try to get away from like streaming music and seeing what happens to the music industry. It's like, you have to kind of meet halfway Netflix, and Hulu and Amazon, like taking on TV and film. And it's like, there, there's good and bad to it. You're right. So what I hope is there, there's a couple of things that are going on with it. One is, after listening to a couple of the samples, what I can gather, but I haven't listened to like a full book, so I don't know this, but I've been reading like reviews of it and articles about it. I've listened to the samples they have on Apple. And it basically sounds like a very, you know, even keeled performance from a good voice. Because what it sounds like they're doing is getting an actor like me and paying them out for a full buyout of their voice. And, and that usually requires like hours and hours and hours of recording different things so that they can then manipulate your voice into saying any word that they want. So I'm sure there's a good paycheck at the end of that day, but that voice is now being able to manipulate, being manipulated maybe in perpetuity to create all of these, uh, you know, audiobooks that, or, or, or anything, you know, it could be just instructional videos, it could be whatever. Um, depending on what kind of contract you sign. And there's no union contract for this. So I don't know what these actors are signing. It could be just like, yeah, we can use your voice for whatever we want for, you know, in perpetuity for forever and ever and ever. Um, so I'm not concerned about my job because I'm like, okay, I, I have like enough of a relationship, a following an ability that I was like, I think that I can bring enough to the table that if you put me side by side by a computer, it's not going to be the same thing. You know, you, there'll be similarities. Like if we're just reading a paragraph that's just basic, you know, description of a, a, of a room, then maybe it's going to be pretty similar. But as soon as like, wait a minute, I see a spider in the room. I'm allergic to spiders. That tension in my voice that's going to come out. I don't think, you know, they can manipulate that to the degree where you're going to really sense that difference in cadence, you know, a different character voice coming in, um, my voice in particular, like I'm not a very like smooth go to bed narration type of voice. Like my voice is all over the place. And that can be either write what you want in a narrator or it can be annoying. And it's just each to their own. And AI can't do that. AI is not doing like the kind of voice that I'm doing. Um, so I'm not super concerned about it, but I am concerned about the technology. The union needs to kind of really think about it. Uh, talk about like the contracts. Maybe they can make contracts where it's like, okay, I record and I can do AI but maybe I get a you know residual check for every book that I narrate. So it's like, here's a check for 250 bucks for every 
book that it goes to, something like that. I mean, I, the, smarter people than me will figure that out. Um, but for like maybe news articles, like maybe you go to your local news, uh, your local newspaper, you live in Ohio, you come from a small town, you go to your website for the local newspaper. They don't have the budget to hire narrators to do that, but that's becoming a much bigger thing. Apple News, New York Times Online, uh, you know, all these people, they have the news articles recorded and that would be a perfect example of like maybe AI starts to take over that, those jobs, you know, because you might not need the kind of nuance in a uh, reader's um, voice to do those. Overall, it's terrifying. I mean, robots are taking over the world. That's the underlying message is, you know, we got to fight back for our oppressors I, I, of the robot rebellion. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm we made some be, honesty. I'm trying to be yeah. very PC about this, but like these are end of days times <laughs> that we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, obviously, obviously, you know, I mean, there. listen, there's AI books coming out. So they're, they're coming for us too, man. They're, they're coming, they're coming for all of us, right? So yeah, some, some tweet I read recently was like, you know, a futurist from 1950 was like, let's do AI so that we can focus on, you know, reading and writing and all our artistic crafts and AI will take care of the mundane jobs. And now futurists are like, let's get AI to do all of the artistic work so we can focus on our mundane jobs. And it's like, that's what's happening. The... <laughs> It's too appropriate, but yeah, no, that's, it's, it's scary. It's exciting. It, it's interesting to me to hear about kind of the two very opposite ends of the spectrum, right? That we're talking about AI seems like it could be good for something that's a more neutral story, like, you know, a news story, as you were saying, but then you can see the production that's going into with, you know, multi-person cast doing something that's basically just becoming, you know, a, a movie for the years, right? That's what a, you know, radio play is, you know, which happened yeah. before movies anyway. Um, oh man. Thank you so much for talking with us about this. I, I don't know about the, the viewers out there, but this to me has just been so fascinating, so educational. And I, I really, really appreciate you coming on to talk about it. Um, obviously, no, it's my pleasure. Oh, well, thank you. And if, if anyone's got, you know, a quick closing thought they want to ask or, you know, bring up, feel free. But uh, otherwise, I, I will just keep asking questions all day. And I don't think anybody wants that <laughs> but me. So any last things from either of you? I'm going to ask one more question. Um, yeah. Hopefully it'll be quick. So let's say I'm an indie author that really wants to create an audiobook of my new work. And I'm a little smarter than that Cameron Hopkins kid. And so I don't want to read Stop it. Stop trying to take his job, man. We already uh, talked about the robots yeah, taking his job. <laughs> I am, I'm not on the side of the AI. And so I want to hire an audiobook narrator. How do I go about that? You know, I, I don't have as much experience about the, uh, with this as a lot of other narrators, but the, the most common answer to that question is, through CRX and CRX is kind of like this, you know, golden hub of, you can say, I'm looking to hire this type of narrator. I'm willing to pay X amount and you can audition and, and work through um, a bunch of different from novices that are recording, you know, you know, they have maybe 10 books under their belt and they live, you know, in new England and it's kind of a side project for them, side hustle, or you can try to get somebody who's like won a bunch of awards and, and, and all that. And depending on your budget and timing, and maybe you find somebody who would like to do it, but Cameron, I'll do your book. No problem, man. We'll work it out. Yeah. If, they, if, if I, if, if my voice fits any of your books, like it's a done deal. You don't have to go to CRX. None of that. All right. Just ignore all those things you just said about CRX. I'm not going to link it. No one's going to know about it. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, I was actually saying it's it's funny you mentioned because uh, my wife uh, did a little bit with CRX and yeah it's it's pretty cool from the the user end too uh, of someone who's doing audio you can put in some samples you can like read some things that someone might have as like a quasi audition so yeah there there is some good technology out there for uh, for getting it so thank you for you know providing some information about that as well this has been so much fun for me I hope others again you too and you know those watching have had fun again Dan thank you for joining us uh, you know all the best as you continue to keep reading books and and <laughs> not let AI take over right yeah We're man keep working toward that future and I'll uh, fight the good fight thank you keep it up man keep it up all right all thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time